Now, one of the coolest things about software development is to package up your application so you can share it with somebody else and they can use it. Like think about VS Code. We actually didn't install Electron or Node.js, the two technologies that for sure drive VS Code. We just installed VS Code. And that's really cool because it makes it really easy for everybody to just run that program. We want to do something very similar with Python, and we're going to be doing that today in day 28 using a tool called PY Installer, Py Installer. And we're not going to be creating a GUI or a graphical user interface like VS Code. Instead, we're just going to be able to execute some Python code as a bundled package. So let's get to it. In this one, we're going to be using Py Installer or PY Installer to bundle our Python app and all of its dependencies, in theory, into a single package. Now, Py Installer doesn't support 3.8 yet, or Python 3.8. So if we actually scroll down on pypy.org, what we'll see is only 3.5 to 3.7 are supported. So you're going to want to use one of those versions by downloading it on python.org or however you download Python in the first place um, and just finding the system that you're going to want to work with. Now for us, we haven't done anything in Python that Python 3.6 couldn't also run. We've been using 3.8, but 3.6 is definitely useful still, and it will be for years to come. I mean, they even still have Python 2.7 listed, which is incredibly old now. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into VS Code and do the next caveat that we have, which is, well, it's a couple things. First, let's go PWD. And what we wanna make sure is when we actually use our project, we use an underscore and no spaces. So PWD or DIR, if you're on Windows, you wanna make sure that there are literally no spaces in here. The next thing is we wanna go ahead and say Python 3.6, and dash M, V, E, and V, period. So we're gonna be using V, E, and V as our virtual environment manager instead of pip E, and V because of how Py Installer finds things. V, E, and V to me has been much, much more useful than pip E, and V with Py Installer at this point. Maybe in the future that's gonna change, but for now we just need to put all of our virtual environment stuff in the same folder that we're working on it doesn't matter what system you're on, just make sure that you see all of the virtual environment things in there. In other words, if we actually type out source bin slash activate on Mac and Linux, your virtual environment will activate. If you're on Windows, you'll do just dot slash scripts slash activate. Okay, so now we are finally ready to install uh, PY installer. So we'll go ahead and do pip install PY installer. Now, if you accidentally install PY installer to your entire system, you're gonna want to uninstall that. You wanna make sure that you're using PY installer inside of the virtual environment that you're working on. Um, Cause if you install it globally, there's gonna be conflicts and stuff like that. So uh, just do your best to not install it globally. Um, so the next thing is we just wanna verify that PY installer is installed and we see you know, this sort of error when we write it out where it's just giving us a bunch of advice of what we can do, right? Um, so you could also probably do python-m py installer after it's actually installed. Um, but in this case, it looks like it's not working, but I have had that work before on other systems if for some reason yours is not. Okay, or rather if this is not. So now that we've got that, it's time to actually build some baseline project before we even use Py installer. But there's really no purpose in going forward if you're not able to get here. All right, so we're gonna use Flask and Waitress to build a web application. So let's go ahead and do pip install Flask and Waitress. Waitress is similar to G-Unicorn where it's actually going to handle running our Flask application. Um, this is something you can use in production as well on a web server, like a production web server, but we're gonna use it for our application. So now that I have that installed in day 28, I'm gonna create several folders here. First is the SRC folder. Next is the actual Flask project name, whatever I wanna call it. In my case, I'll call it CFEOS. 
as in it's a very simple application that is going to be cross-platform. Um, inside of SRC, I'm also going to make a wsgi.py file. And then I'm also going to make one last thing, which is going to be data. Okay, so any sort of relevant data or things that I might need to package for my project are going to go in that folder. So first things first, let's go ahead and make our Flask application. And inside of here, I'm going to make two files. First is an init file to turn it into a module that Python knows about. Next, I'm going to go ahead and create main.py. And then inside of init, I'll just do from main or rather from dot main import all. OK, so now inside of main, I'll just go ahead and do from flask import flask. No surprise there, probably. And I'm also going to import the path lib. So import path lib, which is a, a fantastic alternative to using uh, the OS lib, which is also great, but path lib is better. So I'm going to go ahead and give my base directory being equal to path lib dot path. That's capital P path of this file. And then we can go ahead and resolve this. And then get the parent element. Uh, I will actually return this base directory from Flask um, so we can see it. So let's go ahead and create our Flask app. And I'm just going to call this web underscore app is equal to Flask. And we use underscore underscore name. This is very, very common with Flask on how you initialize a Flask application. And then we will create our index route by doing at web app dot route homepage there and then the available methods hopefully you're following along here if you're not i will explain some of this in just a moment and we'll call this index and i'll just return that our you know dir is this string of base dir and then i'll give it 200 response okay so if you're not familiar with flask the general idea is we create a Flask application, and then we add a route. What this is going to do is it's going to allow us to have a HTTP site going at our local host with some sort of port, let's say 5000, and then on that home page, right? So if we change this route to like ABC, this would be ABC. Now, I'm not going to go into Flask too much here other than some basic things like that, um, because that's not really the purpose of this, but that's just generally speaking how Flask works. So this is an incredibly minimal Flask application. So now that we've got that, we can create one more aspect of this Flask app, and that's our WSGI file. So inside of here, what we'll do is we'll import waitress. So we'll go ahead and do from waitress import serve. I'm also going to import from CFE OS, we're going to import our web app. Okay, so CFE OS is this folder right here. Waitress, of course, is what we installed. And the reason it can grab that web app is because in it is importing everything from main.py, which has the web app itself. Okay, so then we can serve this with waitress with underscore underscore name equals to underscore underscore main. And then we just do serve. And this is going to be our web app. Web underscore app, rather. And then we can set the host, which in this case, I'm going to actually declare 0.0.1, .0, uh, just like that. So 127.0.0.1. That's a very common place for our host to be. Um, and I'm going to set the port that I want to use. In this case, I'll just go ahead and say 5002. Uh, and then we'll give the number of threads we want to use. Definitely check out their documentation here. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and use two threads. Their documentation uh, recommends how you're going to want to thread this based on the system that you're working with. Two threads, even one thread is probably fine, but we're just going to go ahead and stick with two threads. So this will actually serve our web application. So let's go ahead and just give this a shot. It's really simple. So I'm still in the root of this project or day 28. And I just want to run this WSGI file. It's really simple. We just do Python SRC slash WSGI.py, hit enter, 
and I get unknown argument port. Oops, that should be a lowercase port, not uppercase. Try that again. And now, as we see, it's serving on localhost 5002. We can open that up, and that gives me an absolute path to the root of that project, right? So the root of the Flask application itself. So it's going into this folder, right? So that's what that's what this base directory does. So if we want to get the you know the data directory, for example, we, what we would do is say data dir equals to the base dir dot parent. So this goes up a level to src. Whoops. So um, the parent directory would be this src folder from CFEOS, and then we would do slash data. Okay, so then we can actually grab this and call this the data dir, and we just pass in a string. The reason you want to turn it into a string is because you don't want a path live path object. So we can cancel that server out with control C, run that all over again, and refresh in here. And oops, um, oh, these just reorganized, but there you go. Now we've got our data dir and our main project directory. But of course, this is actually not how we'll grab things from our data directory. What we need to do is have relative paths because of Pi installer. Uh, so the actual source code itself is fine, but actually where we store data is going to be a little bit different than this. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, there's a really good chance that your project will have other kinds of files that aren't Python files. So like images or videos or machine learning models, those resources need to be loaded a little bit differently with PyInstaller applications. So let's take a look at how to load it with just pathlib and then we'll adjust it only slightly to load it where it's a little bit more robust and ready for PyInstaller. So the data directory that I have is inside of the SRC folder. So it's outside of my primary project here. And I just put an arbitrary image of beach.jpg uh, just to illustrate this purpose. So I'm going to go ahead and say img path is equal to that data dir slash, and it's just main or rather beach.jpg. Okay. And of course, I can actually bring this into my response down here. And I'm just going to bring in whether or not it exists. So image path dot exists. Okay. So that's a cool thing about pathlib is you can just do dot exists to see if that's a real file. So if we restart the server with control C, press up and enter, we can take a look. And what we should get is a true value for that image path. So what I wanna do now is actually change this only a little bit to where it will take for account our PY installer, you know, eventual data file. Uh, so inside of CFEOS, I'm gonna make a new file in here and call it resources.py. Of course, you don't have to call it that, but to me, calling it resources is telling me where these resources live. So there's a couple things I want to import. So first off, I'm going to import pathlib, and I'm also going to import sys, and then we're going to define git resource path, and this is going to take in a relative path. Now, when I say relative path, I'm going to say it's going to be something like this. So relative path being... Um, relative to my entire resources. So all of the resources for this project that I'll add into my build, I need to know what that relative path is. So my resources for this image, that path will end up being data beach.jpg. So I need to actually be able to load that single thing in. And I can use pathlib here as well. So it should be that string as is. It should also be able to do pathlib.path something that you probably have seen before as well. Um, but also relative path being like OS path dot join data and beach dot JPEG. And so I need all three of those things to be able to work for this relative path. So it's actually not really that hard to do. First off, we are just gonna re-declare the relative path as rel path. And I'll just say pathlib dot path and then passing in that relative path. Now, do not put resolve here. Resolve is gonna to attempt to find where that actually exists. 
again, there's a relative path, so just making a path lib um, actually path, then it will be treated the way we need it to. The next thing is where data is going to live. Now in development, the development base path, well, it's actually identical to this right here, right? So this base directory is where SRC is. It's identical to that, um, except one more thing. Okay, so we actually wanna have just dot parent as well. Because if you remember also back in main, we have base dir dot parent. So this base directory is actually the root of the Flask project itself. And then the data dir goes one directory higher than that. So our actual base path is that directory. So I call this the dev version because what py installer adds to this whole system is an attribute added to our sys package. And that attribute is underscore M E I P S S. This will actually give us the relative path when we build our project. So my actual final path will be base path equals to S or git attribute from S I S Y S from sys or the default will be that dev base path. And then what we're going to return is the base path and the relative path. Okay. So, um, you know, if this attribute's not there, it's going to default to whatever that is. And of course this is our dev path. So this should actually work once we build our Pi installer application, but it will also work now with our development environment. So, um, now what we can do is actually use this on main.py. So let's come back in here and do from.resources, import this git resource path. And now my data directory, I'm just gonna literally pass in git resource path for that data directory. Now you still might need this base directory for relative root of the Flask project for so many other things. Uh, but now that I've got this git resource path, it shouldn't have actually changed the value of it, especially if you didn't change this to resolving, right? You definitely want to resolve the file itself and getting two parent levels up because of where resource.py is. Now, if resource.py was in a, another directory lower, you would absolutely need to adjust for that in here. So let's go ahead and restart this, run it and refresh, and it, literally the exact same data. So again, if we actually change this to being resolve and rerun that, we now get false in a completely different location. Um, so yeah, you definitely wanna make sure you take account for that. All right, so here are the build scripts that we're gonna be using for our operating system. Now, of course, on the left, we have Mac and Linux, and on the right, we have Windows. The general rule of thumb is if you need to run it on that operating system, build it on that operating system. So run it on Windows, build it on Windows. Run it on Mac, build it on Mac. Run it on Linux, build it on Linux. Now you can actually build it on Linux using Docker as well. So you don't actually have to have the entire Linux operating system to build it for Linux. You can just use Docker. And one caveat for Mac users is there's actually a couple binaries that we need to include here which are the TK and TCL frameworks. We just include them like that. Now this reference will be on uh, our GitHub. And if for some reason these aren't installed, you can either install it using Homebrew or using Xcode and just install from there. So the next thing is we activate it, we call PY installer, and then we've got our entry file. So this entry file or entry point is the Python file that we are gonna be primarily importing items from, which we'll look at in a second. And then dash F actually turns it into a single file, one single file execution. Uh, so if we look at that entry point, which is wsgi.py, we have a number of other imports in here, right? So we have the CFEOS module, as well as the waitress package that we installed with pip, so those things are already being imported. Pi installer actually looks for the things that are imported and will attempt to package those into uh, the build script as well, right? So that's gonna do it automatically. 
But in that same vein, you can actually add in some hidden import items here as well. And I found that every once in a while you add it in as a hidden import. And a lot of times it actually will for sure do it where sometimes if you don't have it as a hidden import, and you just assume that it's being imported, you might actually run into some issues. So, so when in doubt, just add it in as a hidden import. You shouldn't run into additional issues that I'm aware of. So that's true on both of these, right? Next line is the name of it. So if we look at both of these, of course, the names are only slightly different, right? And um, you can call it whatever you'd like to call it, CFE-OS-Windows or Mac, just kind of makes sense for these environments. One I'm going to build for Mac, one I would build for Windows. The difference, one of the differences is actually how we add in data. It's a string here, the first half of this string before the colon on Mac has the relative location to where this build script is and then where its destination should be. So it definitely has a colon between those two. I'll discuss that in a second. Windows users, very similar, but it has a semicolon instead. It's like, why doesn't it do the exact same thing? I don't know, but that's how it works. And also you want to actually use the paths that are system specific, right? Either forward slash or backslash, depending. Um, and then of course that hit an input. And then the last thing is this clean call. So what clean is going to do is actually just remove the old builds and then add it in. So let's say for instance, you actually wanted to add another directory. You wanted to use another directory. Well, it's actually really simple. You would just use add data again, and then image, like let's say images and do something like that. Okay, so you would do the same thing on Windows as well. Now, I don't actually need to do that here, uh, but it, that's just the general rule of thumb. But if you go a little bit further, you can actually get specific file types. And this specificity is probably a good idea when in doubt. Like what are the files that you for sure want to bring over? Just add .jpg, star.jpg, or star.mp3, or mov or pickle or whatever it is that you want to bring over and then the destination directory now when i say destination directory i think the directory that holds these items should be the same as the destination so if you're using data you would want to grab that one and if you're using subdirectories you would also want to call that so say for instance we did data you know images jpeg i would just then do data images like that Okay. And all these things are going to be worth testing out on your own as well to make sure that that data is actually coming through. And we'll see what that what happens with that. Now, do realize that this SRC in front here is going to be relative to my build script, which is outside of where SRC is. If it was inside of SRC, we would have to change these things ever so slightly. But I like keeping it outside of the entire project itself because I think it makes a little bit more sense to do so because of where we want our final project to be built to. So without further ado, let's actually run this command. So I'm gonna go ahead and do chomod build.sh. This of course, or rather chomod plus x build.sh. This of course is just for the Mac and Linux users. If you're on Windows, you can just run dot slash build.ps1. That's you Windows users for Mac and Linux build.sh. So by now it should be built. It actually won't take that long because this is not that big of an app. And then what we see is this dist or distribution folder that will have our actual executable. So if I close out the one that was running and do dot slash dist slash CFE dash OS dash Mac or dash windows if you're on windows, notice that it's serving this file and now when I refresh, I've got my image path being true. It shows me a brand new data directory that is not relative to this code whatsoever, right? So that's a key distinction with those resource paths that we had. This is now in a brand new location, but yet it's still actually getting that file, which is denoted by just knowing that it's there. It's like actually finding it. Um, which is actually really important to do. But as it stands right now, I could actually share this file. If you have a Mac, you could run it directly on your Mac. Uh, you might have to give permissions to run it, but you absolutely could. 
Um, and notice that it's only 7.7 .7 megabytes. So that's, I mean, it's kind of big, I guess, but it's also not that big considering that Python's, everything we needed for Python is in there. Flask is in there. Um, and then also Waitress. So it's got a lot of capabilities for only 7.7 .7 megab megabytes, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, Windows, it might be a little bit different of a build size, uh, but that's not that big of a deal. One other thing you might want to do is actually add a icon to this executable. So you can say icon equals to icon.icns. That, of course, is for Mac. If you're on Linux, it's I believe it's a PNG file. If you're on Windows, it is an ICO file. And ICO, and then with a tick there. Okay. So what we've got here then with these icon files, you want to actually put them in the root of your entire project directory where the virtual environment is, as well as the build script. I put them there because I've had the best luck putting them right next to the build file. You probably could put it into SRC or in the data, uh, but I really like putting it next to wherever I'm building it because it just seems to work better across all systems uh, and creating an ICNS file or ICO file. Just Google how to do that. It's actually pretty easy to do. Um, so now that we've got this, I will say that there are a number of caveats with building this. The first thing is actually using a data directory or data file type that just doesn't exist. So if you tried to build this now, you should actually run into some errors. Now, even if I don't see an error, it's going to happen from time to time that if you're using an invalid extension or you're using um, something else, like an invalid folder that's actually not there, you will get some issues like this right here, right? Unable to find star.abc. Like I literally do not have any files inside of data that has the ABC extension. Um, but that would also be true with a folder that's not there. And in this case, it actually didn't even build the project at all. Uh, so that's a big one. The other thing is the hidden imports. Now, I have Waitress in the hidden import, even though it's not a hidden import. It's an import that is very clearly there. Now, for me, when in doubt, I add the package I need in this hidden import. Now, this hidden import is really good when it's a package that's being used in your project, but maybe not on a top level package. Like if it's a dependency to one of your packages, using hidden imports is often a very good thing. But luckily, when you actually build it, when you go to run and build it, it will often give you pretty good errors related to not being able to find a package. But then, of course, when you actually run the application, it will also tell you, hey, cannot find whatever that package name is. Um, and of course, this is actually one of the challenge of Pi Installer is some packages just simply can't be packaged up inside of Pi Installer. It just doesn't work. I've had a number of issues with some asynchronous packages. I've had a number of issues with machine learning packages, um, but just generally speaking, it does work really well. There is uh, overall a, an amazing amount of support to package all kinds of PyPy packages or Python packages in general. One of the things I've also found that if it's not packaging up very well, you could always bring that package into your SRC folder. In other words, go into the virtual environment or rather into lib and finding whatever that package is and dragging all of that python file into your actual src folder and then modifying it as you might need now just generally speaking you don't want to do that you want to use the virtual environment and you want to use pip install to do all those things but if you need to use the site package and make changes so it does package up and work with py installer just make note of that and then also make sure that inside of your SRC that you uninstall the, you know, site package version of it. Uh, I've had some great effect with that as well. So now that you have a general idea of how to package a project in Pi Installer, the biggest question is, where do we use these things? The biggest question is, when do you actually use this kind of packaging? Now, for me personally, it's when you bundle it into a desktop application of some kind or a graphical user interface. So if you have an Electron application and you need to run some Python code specifically, this is when you actually go about doing it. You build Pi Installer to do that. The other part is I can actually send this to anyone. They can double click and open it. 
what that's going to do is open up terminal for them. Not that they would know exactly what that is, uh, but then it would actually run that server. Right. So if they have other applications that need to use what's in that server, they would now have it. Right. So then I can just navigate to whatever that location is. And there you go. There's that application running again. But as far as like actually using this to deploy on a web server, well, you totally could do that. But I actually wouldn't recommend that being the best option. It's a much better option to control the operating system environment because of all of the potential problems with building and running the Pi installer app on various systems, right? So like, I don't wanna have to rebuild this app every single time I'm going to deploy it. That might take a lot of time and the app might start to get really big. Further, some of this data, you know, I don't necessarily need to repackage and send to a web server every single time. You could just either leave it on the web server or leave it somewhere else that, that brings it in. Uh, and then leaving it like this, as far as using Pi Installer, is just not ideal for that. And then there's something called Docker that actually bundles the operating system level even better than this and just essentially runs the code. So um, Pi Installer is great for a lot of these like smaller applications. Now, if you're a network systems engineer, you could probably use Pi Installer to distribute m small little Python applications or even big ones, but Python applications that you wanna run across a bunch of different servers. And Pi Installer would be a really easy way and unique and consistent way to do that without too much overhead, right? So it actually bundles the app pretty well into a fairly small app. Uh, but to me, it's actually just putting it into a desktop application or a GUI application so that I can, with reasonable certainty know that the Python part of that GUI will absolutely run correctly every single time. Now, the biggest application to me is actually running any sort of machine learning application that I don't want to retranslate into something different, right? There are ways to change a machine learning model into other kinds of executable code, but it adds another layer of complexity, which Pi installer even if it is a little complex, does definitely take away some of that stuff. So anyways, that's it for Pi Installer. Please let me know if you have any questions on this and uh, let me know what you end up building. This was day 28, so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.